This is Life Transformation Radio. Prepare to engage. Seatbelt activated. Download initiated. Your quantum journey of transformation begins in three, two, 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 one. Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. Hi, I'm Rob Actis, best-selling author of The Law of Action, voice actor, business mindset coach, the podcast whisperer, and Mr. Action himself. Here at Life Transformation Radio, we are committed to share more about real life, love, the power of positivity, romance, and of course, laughter. We care about helping others find their internal drive and purpose, and we celebrate life's challenges and overcoming them. On the show, my guests are amazing people who are forces for good in the world around them and live a life of transformation. My guest, actually two guests today, do just that. Today, David Gold and I discuss stepping into who you are and what you are here to do in the spirit of transformation in relationship. If you are looking for a relationship or you're in a relationship, this is the show for you. David Gold brings the full power and wisdom of his 45 years as a businessman, trial lawyer, executive consultant, and spiritual mentor to liberate world-changing executives and entrepreneurs from the shackles of self-doubt and self-disqualification. David, welcome to Life Transformation Radio, and please introduce your amazing partner. I'll have her introduce herself. She needs needs to. No, you do it. Okay. No, I'm putting him on the spot. We're going to check out this relationship right now. You can introduce her. The the, the first time we talked, I said, you got great pipes, which you already know. I mean, I I just love listening to you in action. (laughs) So I'm here today with my beloved, my my wife, my my soul twin, my best friend, um, my biggest fan, and my most um, discerning critic. And um, critic's probably not the right word, but my partner. And that's Julie Reeves, who we will talk more about that, who popped into my, fell out of the universe for me about seven and a half years ago and has taken all of those things that you talked about, all the, you know, kind of amazing resume points that I did as a, as a trial attorney, as a spiritual seeker, as an entrepreneur, as a business mentor, and discovered that, that my life wasn't a, a, a spiritual hero's journey or some rags to riches success story but was actually a love story. And I think that's something so many of us find as we go about doing the things that we think we're here to do or we imagine we need to do. And then somewhere along the line, when we let our guard down and when we are receptive to what life really wants to bring us, we can discover something beyond anything that we could possibly have dreamt. And that's who's, that's the person sitting to my right. I love it. It's a twofer. We're going to be talking about love and romance in transformation. So, Julie, welcome to Life Transformation Radio. Thank you, Rob. So, David, you can just step out and the adults in the room will just continue this conversation. (laughs) (laughs) So, so you brought Julie here today and uh, you, you, you must have, have a plan of action of why. Well, one, because I enjoy doing podcasts, recordings, or radio with her more than I enjoy doing anything else. And also because, yeah, I mean, I've done amazing, I've done some amazing stuff, but I think the most unimaginable accident or good fortune that befell me is, is Julie. And I think that that becomes more and more evident as we continue on our journey together and as we interact with others, whether, you know, kind of in a formal setting at this or just hanging out with people, that what we have discovered and what we have, what we enjoy daily is something that is not meant to be kept for us. And Rob, also just for you and I talking as, you know, professionally, but also as friends, is another man who without, I don't want to give your secrets away, but has been transformed in all the best ways by, by finding a partner who is truly your equal and your best friend that this was something you and I had in common. And I wanted to be able to, if not talk about yours, at least be able to share in the joy that you and I both have in finding the women that we did. 
Absolutely. And I, I don't, I don't think that uh, we're equal in any way, shape or form. I think she is far superior to me in, in all ways. And it helps me rise to the occasion. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll raise the tide for all boats to rise. And, and she definitely does that. She makes me a better, a better man, far better man, far, far better man. And I just, just knowing you, David, I would say that Julie must make you a far, far better man because she's pretty incredible. I can feel their energy, um, through the microphone and, and through this video. And I'm glad to have you here, Julie. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right. So we're talking about romance and love and transformation. And, you know, it's all about connection and communication. So it's important. How, how did you guys meet? How did you guys come across? How, how did the universe put things in alignment? Cause it's, it's, I, I just have a feeling that it's, there's, there's a story. I just oh, have yeah. a feeling. I just yeah, have a feeling there's a story. There's a, behind every great love, there's a great love story, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I believe that's actually literally true. Um, yeah. I mean, we have, we, our story is is pretty phenomenal, and and we could spend the whole time just telling the story. So I always, I, I usually encourage David to keep it shorter. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how well we go with that. Um, but yeah, I to uh, to quote a friend of David's who was a what was he the abbot at a monastery yeah, he, in he, South Carolina? He's the abbot of a Trappist monastery in South Carolina, so he knows a little something about God. So and he. When I met him, uh, gosh, I don't know how long this was after you and I, our love was revealed, but he said, Julie, how did you happen to fall out of the universe for David? And I said, that's exactly it. That's a, you got it. How did you know? I fell out of the universe for him. Um, and what that looked like is that I, my family was living in, uh, one part of the state of North Carolina. David was in another part of the state of North Carolina. My family was moving to uh, to an area where he, his daughter and my daughter were going to be in the same class. Now, my former husband and I had, several months before this, decided to separate. Now, hear that. I said just months. You know, David was four years out of his marriage. I was just months. Oh, I got that. Um, had no intention whatsoever of finding some, someone. I was so not in that space at all that it wouldn't have even occurred to me. You know, it wasn't even on my radar. I couldn't even recognize it, you know, because I, I had no intention whatsoever of getting into another relationship. Until my idea was until my kids were raised. Um, and he and I met initially just he sent an email to me and then we talked on the phone because he was he was welcoming the new families to this class. That was a volunteer position he had taken on. And um, the first time we spoke. It was just like we were. It, it was, there was no getting to know each other. There were no formalities or, you know, superficialities. We just immediately dove right into it. We barely talked about my family moving to this new city and joining this school. We went straight into just personal conversations. And, you know, I found myself telling him that, that I had just a few months before that been you know, separated from my children's father and, and didn't really understand why I was telling him that because I had barely told my friends, you know, wow. I had barely told my former husbands and my closest friends. Um, so to share this with a total stranger was a little bit surprising and definitely unusual for me at that point. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm more private. David's, he's, <laughs> David's David. Everything's just out there with David. His whole life is out there for, he'll share it with anybody and every. I, I keep things much closer. And here I was telling this man. A while after that, we came here to visit the school. And so David and I met for lunch. And I would say that was the beginning of a, what we call a spiritual friendship. You know, he had been a, 
he'd been a devotee on the spiritual path for decades. I, for in my own way, you know, I was, I, I considered myself a spiritual person. Um, and so I just recognized that, oh, I think that we're, we're like spiritual brother and sister. And um, so we developed a bit of a friendship, not even a lot of one. It's not like we talked every day or even every week. But when my family finally moved to this new city and we were, you know, I was at that point physically separated from my husband. We had, you know, we were living in different homes going through the process of divorce. David was helping me with some, some issues that came up because he's a lawyer, not with the, not with the marriage or the divorce, just with some other things. And um, we started to get closer, but I'm going to let you take the story. So let me, I want to fill in a couple of blanks there, Rob. And one is that when, when she talked about the fact she was telling me things, I, I was stunned by her authenticity and it wasn't that she was, you know, nothing, nothing showy just by the fact I could feel, Oh, this is a real human being. And just what you hear now, the, her measured words, the way she talks, the way things are heartfelt, the thoughtfulness of it all. And also the fact that as I would go deeper, which I like to do, like you and I did when we met, she'd follow me there and she was never a backing off. And so when, when the call ended, I thought, "Whoa, this is this is interesting." And I wondered, it would be having been four years out of my last marriage, if there might be some romance here. But as when we met, there was obviously none. And so we were, we were. I was resigned, but you know, appreciative. I wasn't like, "Oh, poor me." I thought, "Okay, we're going to be spiritual friends," and that's what we continued to be for a number of months until everything changed. Until our love was revealed, and. I'll turn that back over to you because I love to hear you tell the story. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, that that's the way that we don't talk about it like we fell in love. We because that's not that was not our experience of it. Um, our love was revealed, and we voluntarily stepped into it, and that happened over the course of a three day period. Um, David had he was on the board of a an organization he had been part of. He was in Denver for a board meeting. I was here in North Carolina. And for whatever reason, we were just texting and emailing and calling. We just couldn't, we just couldn't communicate with each other enough on this first day when he was traveling to Denver. That wasn't like us. That was something new. We could feel an energy that was present, that was different. Like something was changing. Something was it was like a breeze had blown in and was swirling about us and we were caught up in it, but we didn't have any idea what was happening. Um, that just intensified over the first day. Um, you know, you know, David's in board meetings and he's on the phone, like texting with me, like a teenager, you know, we just couldn't get enough of each other, but still we had no idea. We, we just thought we had no idea what was happening. Um, by the second day, the energy had intensified, and we were, again, same thing, talking, texting, emailing, every opportunity that we had. By some time in the like afternoon of the second day, I said to him, David, do you know what's going on here? Because something was how I could feel it. It was this powerful energy that we were just in the midst of, but I didn't know what it was. I could, I didn't know yet. It hadn't revealed itself yet, but I could feel it. Something, something's happening, you know? And he said, no, he, you know, he didn't know. But by that night, we had, it had been revealed. And by that night, the way I describe it is like a door had opened and we stepped across the threshold, and on the other side of that threshold was our love, completely formed, eternal, immutable, um, and we stepped into it. Well, and- I want to just put something in before we get to the punchline, because we still didn't know if there was going to be any chemistry, because there wasn't before. <laughs> We're still a thousand miles apart. So, so you know, as I'm a guy, obviously, and we're friends. And that's, you know, and the thing you talk about transformation 
you know, we, in transformation, you don't know where you're, you don't know what you're transforming into. Right. You know, you, so you're just we don't know. transforming. Exactly. Exactly. So and I don't know. Fingers crossed and you hope for the best. Yeah. So this is happening. I'm thinking, what's that? You know, this, I'm, I'm happy. I can't get enough of this woman, but she's my friend. So I got these ideas. I don't know what, and that's what he said, like, you know, what's happening. We did not know what was happening. We did. It, so it wasn't like, oh boy, we're falling in love. We're falling in love. Oh, this is, it was no. just like this swirl no. of uncertainty, but sheer joy. It yeah. was just such sheer joy that we shared. And then finally, the third day, well, the third day, I, I, we flew, I flew back that night, and we thought, well, I want to say chemistry. It'll be interesting if there's no chemistry after all this buildup that we've had. And we kissed, and there was chemistry, and then that was, and, and from, from my own perspective at that point, my, love became, my life became unrecognizable. I cannot remember who I was before this happened. I can't, I, I know he was limited. I know he had a lot of, I still, have, you know, I still have a lot of ideas, but in terms of what I thought was possible for life and what was possible in relationship and what was possible in every aspect of life, this opened up for me in a way that I never, I never could have dreamed and which challenged me in such remarkable ways that everything that I thought I had achieved and, you know, through business and law and whatever, or through spirituality really didn't matter anymore. It, it was nothing. These were just these. These were accomplishments, or these were ideas that I have. All that mattered that I was in a love unimaginable, and I wanted to bring. I wanted to fully experience it and to to just transform whatever the transformation was. I wanted more of it, and I wanted more love as I went through it. Yeah, when the, think, when the universe brings you your person, it's amazing. You, you just you just it just flows. You know, it's kind of like everything you do in life. When you just get away from the friction and you let things flow, it's it's universal magic. Yeah, because our love could make changes in our lives that each of us were helpless to do on our own. You wow. know, David was, he was such a dedicated spiritual seeker, you know, Engaging in all sorts of, you know, what most people would view as extreme uh, disciplines to try to achieve enlightenment, because that's what he wanted, thought he wanted more than anything. But, you know, it was like banging his head against a wall. It was so hard to make even the slightest change or, or, or you know, what he would have seen as, you know, improvement or, um, yeah, improving, improving himself. but. Once we stepped into our love, that love just washed through his life. Um, you know, it washed through both of ours, but we're talking about the changes it made in his life. And all of these things that he'd been seeking and trying to change in himself, the, the love just transformed it. And it, yeah. effortlessly. He didn't have to do any work. Yeah. When you, when you, don't fight what the universe has laid out for you. Um, it's it's truly just beautiful and effortless, and it just flows. And you know when you're in that higher state, the magic that can happen if you allow it is so so beautiful. And, and it's interesting because is. You know, you and I are both men of the world. You know, we both deal with empires and careers and, you know, we've done all kinds of things. And the love wasn't isolate. Yeah, it, it was, it, it centered in the two of us. But that, but it was how, what, what, what's become my life, our lives is how, what does this actually look like in the world? What does it look like to be in business and have this kind of love? What does it look like to be a parent in this kind of love? A step parent in this kind of love? That, it's magical and exists in itself, but it's not separate from life. And then, then life, cause then life gets really fun. Then life gets real because yeah, I mean, after a while that incredible intensity of, you know, is going to evolve into something else, but the love is still, the love has never gone anywhere. It's just been, it's now it's just so much a part of who we are and what we do. And, and the one thing I want to, I'm going to make the point again is, we think we know what we're transforming into, 
we think we know that we think we're in charge and we think that we know that we're going to be more of this and less of that or whatever it is that happens. And this is a, this is a change of kind. This is like a, a different kind of a species that you go to. And it required both of us, I'll speak mostly for myself, to let go of the ideas I had of what I thought my life was about, who I was going to be, what love was going to look like, what effect I was going to have in the world. There's a lot of surrender that goes in when you get this kind of a gift. And there's always a surrender and transformation. And I think there's a service element too. And I I don't say this like it's a discipline. We don't get up in the morning and think, oh, we have to, we have to go do our service. It's nothing like that. But this love is a universal love. You know, it, it, in this case, it's particular to David and me, but it's a universal love and it's transformative, not just to us, but to other people. And so in a very real way, we take that love out into the world and just, and, and it, it, it does what it does, you know, it, it affects change in other people's lives as well. And it has nothing to do with us that we're not doing anything. Right. Well, we don't, we don't do any, no one does anything. Like we, I don't do anything. David doesn't do anything. You don't do anything. We are uh, a vessel, a catalyst for whatever is going through us. Yeah. We actually don't get the credit for any of this. Yeah. Uh, And I think when you reach that level of, of, of calm and enlightenment, I think it's, uh, it's, it's truly peaceful to know that, it's not you that's doing it when you get out of the way of your yeah. ego. It's oh, it's such you. a relief. It's, <laughs> yeah. Isn't it such yeah. a relief when you're at the, when you realize yes. like, Oh gosh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be responsible yeah. for my life or anyone else's. I just let it flow. Let, let, let this it love flow. express itself through me. And, and express itself as ourselves. I think that's, yeah. the, that's one of the beautiful things is because I, tried so hard to be something other than who I was for many reasons, you know, some of that through spirituality, some of that through just becoming, you know, a success or whatever. But a lot of it was, so I thought I could be someone who'd be lovable. I desperately wanted to be loved. And I thought, Oh, this is what I need to do. I need to be less of this and more of that and get that, whatever it is. And yeah, I, I, I I have this beautiful sense of being a vessel and in the, in my relationships, whether they're formal relationships of mentoring or whatever it is, I'm constantly, and Julie's very good at reminding me because I got a guy and I get an ego and I think, oh, look what I did. And I want to get up on the top of the rooftops and scream how great I am, you know. But it, <laughs> constantly aware that this is something that's moving through me, but it's moving through me as me. I get to be me. Right. I get to I get to be that vessel as me, the only vessel. It's something you said at the very beginning in your introduction. I get to be the vessel as me, the only person who could be me. And that's yeah. really fun. When you get to be the vessel and fool yourself at the same time, that's heaven on earth. Well, it's heaven on earth when I have Julie by my side. But those right. two really help. So what kind of work can someone do on themselves and and go on a journey? to find the kind of love that you both share. Mm. I'm looking to her like, well, we, there was a, there was a time in our togetherness, Rob, where we decided, you know, we were so, we just wanted everybody to have their version of what we have, you know, life would be, the world would be so different if everybody had love like this in their lives. But we quickly learned we couldn't we couldn't magnetize that into someone's life for them. Right. Nor did we conclude that anyone could magnetize that into their own lives. You know, it may not be everyone's life path that they're going to have a romantic love that is a great transformative love. But what we do know is that everyone can relax into and soften into receiving yeah, and yeah. receiving the best that, you know, everything that life wants to give to them and life wants to give more than we can imagine for ourselves to every human being on the planet, you know, and it's just a matter of us opening to receive that. And then, so that's something that people can do. And it's not about changing yourself. It's not that anything's wrong with yourself. 
it's just really relaxing into your essential nature. And that essential nature is open and receptive and aligned with the, the rhythm of life. And then getting, you know, dropping our ideas as much as we can, stepping outside of the ideas that we have. You know, like I had this idea that I was going to get divorced from my first husband, be single for the, you know, till my children were off to college at least, and then maybe I would open myself up to a relationship. But life had something very different in store for me. And now, and I had, there was, you know, a moment where I did very consciously make the decision to get rid of the idea that I had about what my life would look like for the next 10 years and receive what life had, you know, was offering me right there in that moment. And there was a choice, you know, Mm. it wasn't, it wasn't a complete no brainer. I, I actually had a moment where I made that choice. It was a split second, but it was still there. Yeah. And I think that the more we can get rid of our, you know, rid ourselves of our ideas about what our lives, we want our lives to look like or what they should look like or what society tells us they should look like or, and, and just receive and step, you know, step into line with what life wants to bring us. And everybody, I, I'm, I am certain that everybody can have an incredible love story in their lives if they just open to it. And it may not be a romantic one. It might be a best friend. It might be a parent child. You know, there's all sorts of forms and formats that an unimaginable love can take. And that's a box that we, you know, would do ourselves good to step out of as well is thinking that it has to be a romantic life partner kind of love because it doesn't. Right. And, right. and if I can play off on that a bit, it with me, it was, and I don't know what, uh, there's no cause and effect here. Like the, like the abbot said, she fell out of the universe. What did I do? Did I open up the universe and pull the trap door? Hell no. She fell on top of me and I just took <laughs> her. You know, that was great. But to the extent that, that we like to look for cause and effect or at least correlate, correlates, that Julie and I both, I, we're, we're almost 15 years apart, but both of us when we were young, we didn't, we discovered this when we were just kept talking. We were both young, both of us dreamed of a great love. And I had that yearning in my heart. And I knew, I just knew with a capital K, I would never be complete without that love. And a lot of the reasons I got into spirituality and asceticism and celibacy and all that stuff is because I wanted to burn that yearning out. I didn't want to be, I said, no, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to live in this pain of yearning and not having. And then, interestingly enough, both of us, again, not knowing the other even existed, shortly in, in marriages, being committed people who have children and make a promise and keep a promise and don't want to, you know, break up a home, that's all in air quotes, stayed in marriages. And finally, both of us decided independently of the other, knowing each other existed, we weren't going to live without love. And so, I don't know, again, what the, what the cause and effect is, but to me, to have the guts to say, I'm not going to live without love, and I'm going to acknowledge the fact that I want this really, really badly. And that, I think, just having the courage to, to listen to the heart or to follow that heart, whether it had anything to do with it or not, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly glad that I had before, you know, that that, was, that that fire was burned inside of me and I never was able to extinguish it. Yeah. I, I think that... You know, a lot of people, they want to find their happily ever after, and they have this pedestal of the person they're looking for, of how great they have to be and stuff like that. And I, I think one of the, the keys to success and finding your, your, your person is to focus on you and to be the best you that you can be so that they can see who you are. Um, and I, I think what happens is a lot of people, just like my life sucks, I'm going to go find someone they're going to make my life better. And I don't think that's fair to the other person. I think you need to be the best. And even in relationship, I mean, I talk about this to all the time is that it's not my job to make my wife happy. It's my job to be the best Rob that I can possibly be. And it's her job to be the best Tanya that she can possibly be. And that's where 
magic happens. But I think yeah. when one person is just like not doing the work on themselves and expecting the other person to fix them is quite dysfunctional and not the beautiful love that, that I'm seeing before me with you two. Well, I, that's really beautiful. Rob, yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I want to just add something to that, mm-hmm. something that we are really discovering in the last couple of years. And that is that, I mean, you said it perfectly when you said you want to be the best Rob you could be. Yeah. It's not that you want to be some idea of a perfect person, right? Like so many of us get these ideas that, okay, well, I can never be angry ever again. I can never be irritated. I can never, you know, all these, these things, these qualities and emotions that we ascribe some negativity to. But what we are experiencing is, no, we just need to be us. You know, Absolutely. I need to be Julie, the most full expression of Julie that I can be. And you know what? I come in a package that sometimes is self-righteous. Sometimes it's frustrated, impatient, you know, angry, uh, superior, you know, like we all have all the emotions of a human being at our fingertips, right? And we can all be, we are all everything. Um, David has his own. But for me to learn to love exactly how my creator made me, And to love me just the way that I am and accept myself just the way that I am so that I then am freed to be the best Julie that I can be in the world. And David's the best David that he can be in the world. And and, and somewhere in the middle there we meet and we are, you know, the us. There's an us that's, that's, that's between the two of us. There's an us. And... And that the, the, one of the part of part of this transformation the last couple of years is I learned to love I learned to love myself more through loving Julie. That's true. You know, I learned I don't like I say learns a bad word, but whatever the process, whatever the right verb is, is I was learn I learned to love her. You know, with ever love the totality of her, the totality of her. Even though there were parts of her that I could probably live with. You know, all things considered, if I could you know go back to the blueprint, I might add a little less of this or more of that. But I, the, I love the totality of her. And then I realized, I, I don't know, realize is the right word, but it occurred to me that I could not love her more than I love myself. I could never accept her more than I accept myself. I was limited. If I was saying, oh, yeah, I love you warts and all, but I don't love me warts and all, warts and all, I don't really love her warts and all. So that that's this beautiful two-way street that goes with the more that I love myself, love you know, really – in loving myself or whatever that word means. And you know, that's not narcissistic or not too narcissistic in my case, it probably is. But I mean, you know, loving myself in the sense of just appreciating this creature that I happen to God happen to create. And I happen to get to live as live as then it, then that does extend ways where I just can't say, we you grit your teeth and say, okay, it's a package. I can live with it. I know she's perfect. You know, you're repeating a mantra over and over rather than just having such a profound, authentic sense of self acceptance that you accept the other's self as well. And that's just a beautiful way to live. And then, and then, yeah, you can fight over this or disagree over this and things could drive you nuts over that. And you'll have authentic, you can have authentic reactions that are very, very human and they don't touch the love. Mm -hmm. They just don't touch it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Julie, I'm going to give you the last words. (laughs) There's something that's come up a few times and um, there, and I, I want to make sure I say this out loud. So there was a time in our early relationship where David was having trouble getting his head around, you know, why does she love me? Does she really love me? Like, is, is this love just going to end up, you know, fading away and she's going to leave me? Whatever turmoil that he had in himself. And one day, you know, I've been listening to this for a while and I was kind of done with it. And I, cause you know, when someone's insecure, you can, there's nothing you can say. There's no amount of anything that you can say or do that's going to assure them. Um, and, and I just said, David, I love you for no good reason. And it changed everything for him because he realized the truth of it. 
And I think that this is so true about what human relationships can be is we, we can love people for no good reason. We, you know, there's no, there's no, there's a lot of reasons that I love David. I could list, you know, thousands of reasons that I love him, but is that why I love him? No, not at all. I love him because he's him. You know, I, I love him because he's a, a beautiful human being. You know, the love is no, there, there are actually no becauses. There's no whys of why I love him. And there's such, there's such freedom in that mm-hmm. too. When we let ourselves love people for no reason, you know, for no good reason. We just look when we let ourselves love period. And I had an, ex, I had a, an experience. I used to work in hospice and I had an experience where I was caring for a, a woman who's about, she was about my age now. She was in her fifties and she had terminal cancer. And I were I, I was with her one day for a few hours and I felt this deep, deep love for her. And it's it like, you know, this is, this is 30 some years ago. Um, and it sort of surprised me and it, took me back and I thought, wow, I've only, I've only been with her a couple hours. How can I feel such love for her? And I realized that it takes no time to love. And that's, that's something that I've never forgotten. It takes no time to love. And there's also no reasons. Mm -hmm. There don't have to be any reasons. And, and if I could turn that around. See, he wants to get in the last I word. I knew it. I knew it. No, you know what? No, no, she had the last word. No, no, I can say she has the last word. We're just going to leave it at that. That was so beautifully said. Jay was like, no, I just said, no, that's it. That's all there is. Look at that. Look at the look in his face. He's done. I like Julie had the last word. David, Julie, thank you so much for being here today. And Julie, thank you for having the last word. And it's going to be interesting because he's just dying to say something. I'm not going to let him. Sorry. That's the end of the show. That's it. But thank you so much for being here today on, on Life Transformation Radio. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rob. And thank you so much for your support and taking the time out of your busy and precious day to listen. We so appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me, allowing my very special guests to touch your heart, move your soul, and inspire you to live a life of transformation. I'm Rob Actis. Until next time. This is Life Transformation Radio. Download complete.